Hello, my name is Tom Mens. I'm a full professor at the University of Mons in Belgium and together with Alexandre Decaux and Ahmed Zerouali and Kunde Rover from the University of Brussels, we have been conducting some empirical research on the use of backporting practices in package dependency networks. And this is what I will report to you about today in this presentation. This research has been conducted as part of an inter-university research project called Seiko Assist. You can find more information on the Seiko Assist website. Let me start by introducing the notion of backporting by means of an illustrative example. Suppose we have a package that's under active development. It has already undergone multiple releases. So it started off with uh, version 1.00. We assume the package is using a semantic versioning strategy. It continues to have multiple newer releases, sometimes patches or minor releases. Uh, starting from version 1.02, the developers decided to create a new major version 2.01, 2.02 and so on, while at the same time the first major version continued to be maintained. Now suppose that at some point in time there is a vulnerability that has been detected in version 2.1.0, then the developers find that the same vulnerability is also present in the previous major train in version 1.3.0. So what do they do? They fix the vulnerability in the major train 2 and they backport to fix the same vulnerability in version 1.3.0 by creating a patch that fixes the vulnerability. This goes on, for example, after version 2.2.0, a new major train uh, with version 3.0 is created where we again continue to evolve the package and again perhaps some vulnerability is introduced. The developer checks whether this vulnerability is also present in the previous major trains. If it is the case, then they fix the vulnerability and they backport this in the previous major trains. So uh, here we can see how the notion of backporting helps to uh, detect and port fixes to vulnerabilities in previous major trains. Of course, backporting can also be applied to other changes than just vulnerability fixes. In some previous research in 2021, Chris Bogart and his colleagues published some research in which they, among others, uh, looked at backporting where they reported that it can be helpful for packages to backport uh, their new features to earlier major versions, especially because there can be many dependents that still, for some reason, depend on an earlier major train because they have difficulties to update to the latest version. So to shed some insight into this, they conducted a survey in which they asked developers whether they spend extra time on backporting changes for uh, backward compatibility reasons. So the results of their survey were different depending on the package manager considered. So we see that, for example, for Cargo, there was uh, 15 out, uh, that agreed and 22 that disagreed. For packages, it was quite similar. Also for NPM, while for uh, the Cargo manager, everyone basically disagreed that backporting was useful. So we can see that not everyone agrees on whether there's a need for uh, backporting and we can also see that this depends on the ecosystem that is being considered. In our own work, we wanted to complement these qualitative insights by some quantitative analysis over the real data that we could uh, extract for these four different package managers using the metadata that we extracted from the libraries.io service. To do so, what we looked at was only those uh, active packages in the four ecosystems, so packages that at least had an update over the last 12 months, and we only looked at packages that were actually dependent upon, so there were at least five dependents of each of the packages that we considered. In total, 19,000 packages with at least five dependents, over 700,000 releases of these packages, 300,000 dependents, and in total of 1 million dependencies. We can see, of course, that the numbers are different depending on the ecosystem being considered. Obviously, since NPM is the largest of all of these ecosystems, it has the largest numbers compared to the others, and RubyGems is the smallest of the three considered ecosystems. So we started, based on this data set, to ask ourselves a number of research questions. The first research question was, how many packages have multiple major trains? So to do so, we looked for each package at all of the different version numbers that had been released, and we looked at what was the major version of these available releases. What we observe 
is that for npm packages and ruby gems they tend to have uh, several major trains it could be two or three or uh, more than three an exception was cargo for cargo uh, the majority of the packages considered had uh, only one single major train one of the reasons is that the majority of the cargo packages actually still remain in the major version zero now knowing that the packages tend to have multiple major trains we want to look at the dependence side so if you look at the dependence how frequent it is that the dependence actually still depend on an earlier major version to do so we try to compute what is the minimum number of major trains that in total allow to capture 90 percent of all of the dependents and what we observed is that indeed it's not the majority but still frequently dependents depend on a release that is part of a lower major train which is mostly the immediately preceding major train but it can also be uh, two major trains ago or even further so this actually highlights the need for producers of required packages to continue supporting lower major trains at least the immediately preceding one still focusing on the dependent packages we wanted to know to which extent they are outdated so for each of them we looked at whether they are up to date they actually depend on exactly the latest available version of the package they depend upon or whether they just are some patches behind or some minor releases behind or whether they actually still depend on a lower major train uh, what we observe uh, you can see this in the green line is that the majority of all dependent packages are actually up to date but still what we see here the red curves especially for npm and for packages is that more than one out of four uh, packages are still depending on a lower major train and in npm it is the case that more than three out of ten dependents on such a lower major train are even several uh, major trains behind so the phenomenon is definitely not really unfrequent now having established that dependents frequently continue to depend on a lower major train we want to do some empirical analysis on the prevalence of backports we took a definition of backport that is actually a kind of proxy which is an over approximation any new release that is also applied to a lower major train is considered by us to be a backport if we do this uh, in our data set we count the number of backports as follows uh, for the different package distributions and this number of backports that we found were available in of course a more limited number of packages so the number of packages in each distribution that are actually carrying out backports is quite limited in cargo it is the smallest only 1.7 percent because cargo doesn't uh, really adhere to backporting practices while for um, packages and ruby gems it's much more common even more common than for npm despite the fact that npm has many more packages uh, available when looking into the actual reasons uh, why backporting is being practiced uh, by reading the commit messages and the change logs of these packages we found that there is actually a wide variety of reasons of doing backporting at least according to the definition of our proxy of backport that we have used it can be to fix uh, security vulnerabilities it could also be to simply port some known bug fixes from a higher to a lower major train or to resolve known backward compatibility issues or even to port relevant new functionality to a lower major train now continuing to look at these backporting practices we started looking at which are the earlier major trains that are actually being served by backports uh, this heat map tries to show this uh, visually so here we see all of the different packages and how many available major trains they have and uh, what we can see here on the y-axis is the percentage of uh, major previous trains that are actually being served by backports we see that the percentages are highest for the immediately preceding major train and if you go two major trains behind or, or even lower the percentages go down very rapidly so what we see is that it's primarily the immediately preceding major train that is being served by backports if it is being served because only a minority of package producers are actually maintaining lower major trains is this a problem not really because what we have also seen in some of the previous slides is that if you have dependents that are outdated with a major version it's typically the immediately preceding major version that they depend upon so this means that they will still have the potential to benefit from the backporting practices to this immediately 
preceding major train. What we observed is we'll be, if we look at the specific uh, ecosystems being considered, it was that Packagist actually has considerably more backports. And one of the reasons for this is due to the fact that the new release of PHP 7 was notoriously backward incompatible, which actually forced many packages to backport their features to the previous major train. Another specificity for Cargo is that it has uh, the specificity of actually backporting updates to releases that are still in major version 0, which is a bit strange, but the reason for this is most of the packages in Cargo actually start developing starting from major version 0. We also wanted to find out if packages that have backports uh, have different characteristics than packages that do not have backports. These uh, box one plots shown on top of the slide uh, show a clear difference. And what we could learn from this was that packages that do uh, use backporting practices, they tend to have a longer lifetime. Uh, they tend to have more releases, a higher release frequency, and they also have more dependence. This is not really a surprising result. This is in fact what we uh, expected to see. This slide shows more or less the same thing. So we can see the proportion of packages that depend on packages that are either not having any backports or that actually following backporting practices. And what we can see is the, the number of required major trains for packages with backports or higher, so packages that, that do follow backporting practices, they have more major trains that are actually used by their dependents. The following figure shows the lifetime of the major trains in number of months, and again, if you have packages that have backports, then these packages are actually being maintained for longer periods of time. What is perhaps more interesting is a small analysis that we did on uh, security fixes and whether these are being backported. In this case, we only did it on a very small data set for NPM and for RubyGems. And we try to look at when a security vulnerability is being fixed and in how many major trains is being fixed. Zero means that they are not fixed at all. The percentages are fortunately very low. Uh, one means they are only fixed in the latest uh, available major train. This is the majority of all fixes and they are actually rarely fixed in lower major trains. So what we observe is that if there is a security vulnerability, it tends to be fixed only in the highest major train, even if the lower trains are also known to be vulnerable. This is a bit worrisome because there are still thousands of dependents that actually rely on a lower major train, and this means that they are known to be exposed by the vulnerability. Uh, but only the latest major train is um, having a fix for this vulnerability. So these uh, dependence on a lower major train, they continue to be exposed by the vulnerability. So what can we learn uh, from this? That there is actually a need for uh, better applying backporting practices in package dependency networks uh, in order to reduce the number of vulnerabilities that are potentially affecting thousands of dependents that do not depend on the latest version of the package. So this is what maintainers of vulnerable packages can do. On the other hand, the dependents themselves to not be exposed by vulnerabilities, they should try to upgrade at least to the latest major version uh, in order not to be exposed by such vulnerabilities. So to conclude, what we have learned is that dependents of packages are frequently relying on lower major trains, which means that there is a need to continue maintaining those releases, for example, by applying backporting practices in order to avoid these dependents to become too vulnerable or in order to allow these packages to benefit from bug fixes or even important new features. Uh, what we have also learned is that uh, security vulnerabilities can affect several major trains, but only in the highest one they are fixed. So it is important for dependents to upgrade to the latest major train in order to reduce their risk. What could we recommend? Well, if you are a package producer or even a maintainer of a package distribution, it would be useful to adopt explicit policies about which are the major trains that will continue to be supported by backports and for how long. If you communicate this to your dependents, it can be useful for them to know what they should um, do. An ecosystem should also try to install and promote automated tools and dashboards that will allow to make it easier for package maintainers to actually perform backporting practices. 
and also for dependents to make it easier to upgrade to the latest major train. With this, I conclude my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.